Hi, welcome to this month's TLL Speaker Series presentation. I'm Janet Rankin, the Director of the Teaching and Learning Lab, and I'm so glad you're joining us today. We are thrilled to welcome Eric Mazur, Balkansky Professor of Physics and Applied Physics and Academic Dean for Applied Sciences and Engineering at Harvard. Eric is also a member of the Faculty of Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and past president of the Optical Society. Professor Mazur has led at least two intertwined and immensely accomplished lives. On one hand, he's a distinguished and award-winning physicist whose research uses ultra-short laser pulses to study ultra-fast dynamics in physical systems and to create extreme non-equilibrium conditions in matter. He's a fellow of the Optical Society, of the American Physical Society, and of the American Association of Physics Teachers. He is a member of the Royal Academy of Sciences of the Netherlands and a member of the Royal Holland Society of Sciences and Humanities. He's the author of over 350 scientific publications, 52 patents, and several books. And in his other life, Eric is an award-winning, groundbreaking educator. A few publications and innovations of particular note. He is the author of Peer Instruction, a user's manual published by Prentice Hall in 1997, which explains how to teach large lecture classes interactively. He is the creator, founder of Learning Catalytics, an interactive student response tool that uses data analytics to improve learning in the classroom. He is the author of Principles and Practices of Physics, published by Pearson in 2015, which presents a groundbreaking new approach to teaching introductory class calculus-based physics. And in 2014, Eric became the inaugural recipient of the Minerva Prize for Advancements in Higher Education. I first heard about Eric and his amazing pedagogical accomplishments in the early 1990s. He had just gone public with his work around just-in-time teaching and peer instruction. And in the STEM teaching and learning community, he was a total rock star. With the street cred of a renowned and respected physicist from Harvard, Eric was a leader in the somewhat nascent charge to pull higher ed STEM education out of the Middle Ages, literally. Shifting from information delivery to knowledge creation, discovery, and growth, from instructor-focused to learner-focused education. I've had the joy of attending several of Eric's classes wherein he implemented and used peer instruction and learning catalytics in the early years. And I must say that almost any educator that visited his classes left beyond inspired. They were amazing experiences. Of course, like any good researcher, his work has evolved and grown, building on what he has done before and moving in new, exciting directions. Today, Eric will be telling us about how the pandemic changed his teaching and why he doesn't want to go back. Please welcome Professor Eric Mazur. Okay, so, um, so essentially, I, I want to start this talk by showing you an article that appeared, I think, about a week after we were forced off campus uh, in the Financial Times by <clears throat> the famous uh, futurist uh, Yuval Harari. The title of the article, yeah, this was March 20, 2020. So we were, we were forced off campus, I think, March 13. So exactly a week after we, uh, we switched to remote teaching. And the title of this article is The World After Coronavirus. And I want to, in particular, draw your attention to the second paragraph in this article. He writes there, many short-term emergencies will become a fixture of life. That's the nature of emergency, the fast forward historical processes. And then he goes on to explain that during emergencies, decisions that could normally take years of deliberation are passed in a matter of hours, and, and that technologies that might be immature, even dangerous are, are adopted because the risk of doing nothing is even larger. And then towards the end of the paragraph it says, what happens when entire schools or universities go online? In normal times, governments, businesses, and educational boards would never agree to conduct such experiment, but these aren't normal times. And I remember, so this was right at the beginning, that as I read that, I was wondering, you know, by the way, this article is not really about education. I've read to you the only things that he mentions about education in the entire article. It's mostly about, uh, about personal freedom and surveillance. But I remember after reading that, wondering, you know, 
will this remote teaching that I'm doing now become a fixture of life? Now, before I get there, let's go back to March, 2020, just before the pandemic hit. At that moment, I was teaching a, a, an active learning class, AP 50, Applied Physics 50, focused on teaching introductory physics to engineering and life science students. The course is team-based and it is, you know, students work in, in teams of four or five students. And it is also project-based. And the idea behind making this course, which I taught for a couple of years before the pandemic hit, of making this course both team and project-based was to increase students' intrinsic motivation. They're not learning physics because somebody tells them, here, learn physics, it's good for you. But they're learning physics because it's fun to discover physics and apply it to um, a real world project. Now, as I designed this course about uh, eight or so years ago, not only did I change the format of the course, I also extensively visited the teal classrooms at MIT and, and other uh, active learning spaces actually around the world during a, a sabbatical year that I had. And um, we redesigned our, our um, learning space. For those of you teaching in teal, it will look somewhat familiar. The, the, the T is missing because there's very little technology in the classroom or fixed technology, I should say, in the classroom. Um, everything is, uh, is uh, mobile and 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 you know can be moved around. There's no set arrangement of anything in that room. Um, the space is completely focused on interactivity and the students rather than the instructor. In fact, since you're not very far, I invite you to once come and visit me. I promise you one thing: after visiting my classroom you'll come away thinking Eric Mazur teaches kindergarten. And I think that's the way it should be in learning. They're sitting on the ground. I mean, it's extremely chaotic. There are neither lectures nor exams in my course. Now, eliminating lectures is, is of course, nothing new for me as I developed learning, uh, flipped learning and, and peer instruction back in the, in the 1990s. But developing this course, AP50, gave me the opportunity to actually rethink the overall learning experience uh, for the students. We developed a platform called Perusal, which permitted students to read and annotate either video or text interactively that took care of the lectures. And then the, the class activities were, were focused on a blend, if you want, of six scaffolded uh, best practices loosely organized according to the levels of Bloom's taxonomy, starting from understand here at the top, the top two activities, to apply in the middle, and to uh, the bottom uh, evaluate, giving students an opportunity to evaluate their own um, their own knowledge. Now, I could give a whole talk about this course, but what I really want to get to is what happened in March. So, if you're interested in learning more about that course. There's a page that was made by the Harvard Graduate School of Education on their Instructional Moves website that has lots of short, you know, three to four minute videos about different aspects of the class as well as a full class period. So even without moving from, from uh, MIT to the Harvard campus, you can, uh, you can visit uh, class. And then, you know, on March 13th, 2020, we were forced off campus by the pandemic. And overnight, you know, we, you two, vacated the campus and I transitioned to teaching online. It turned out, however, that the format of this course, apart from the projects, which was somewhat of a problem and required some improvisation, adapted quite well to the online environment. I was able to, to continue the course in that spring semester of 2020 was only minor adjustments. Students were already used to working online for a number of activities and they continued to work in teams, which helped foster 
you know, a sense of community and, and, and helped um, prevent students from getting uh, disengaged. So when the institution surveyed the students at the end of the 2020 spring semester and asked them, was there instructional continuity between the first half of the semester which was in person, and the second half of the semester, which was remote, in my class, a very large majority, 86%, said they agreed with that statement. And in fact, I think around 55 or so percent said they strongly agreed with uh, that statement. So that gave me the courage during the summer of uh, 2020 to go beyond what I'd done and to really in a sense, since there was no travel or anything, to set my time aside to rethink what I was going to do in the next academic year, the fall of 2020 and the spring of 2021, which were both going to be fully remote. And I decided to tackle the problem a little bit differently. Rather than asking myself as I had done, and I'm sure most of us have done, as I've done in, 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 in March, how can I transfer online what I do in a classroom? And so in the panic that ensued from being chased off campus, because that attitude, if you ask yourself the question, how can I transfer online what I do in the classroom? In a sense, um, that move becomes a challenge. And instead of doing that, I ask myself, what can I do online that I cannot do in the classroom? What, opportunities are offered by remote teaching that um, I may not have in the classroom. And I ended up implementing quite a few changes, but they fall basically into three major categories. The first one was to optimize face-to-face -face time. And with face-to-face, -face, I don't mean necessarily in person, face to face. I mean, I consider us here now also being face to face. Your face, if you have your camera on, is you know facing mine. So that was one. The second, and I'll go into more detail what I mean by, by each of these uh, three things, because this is the sort of the, the crux of, uh, of my talk. The second thing was that I decided to personalize and instruction much more than I've done at any other point in my uh, career. And lastly, given the fact that all sort of traditional assessment schemes fell apart during the pandemic, I decided to completely change my approach to student assessment and to establish a continuous, I misspelled it there, sorry about that, accountability um, of my students throughout the term. So let's take these one by one and, and uh, so I can give you more specific ideas of what I uh, was doing. So in terms of optimizing the face-to-face -face time, there were basically two types of face-to-face -face times that I tried to optimize. The first one is the instructional face-to-face -face time. The students was me. And the second aspect, which I think is, you know, maybe even more important for the learning process than the first one, is the student face-to-face -face time, given the team-based learning environment that I had uh, created for them. So I start with that instructional face-to-face -face time. Now, by virtue of the physical classroom, most educational, activities around the globe, even on our campuses, um, are essentially synchronous activities. Everybody has to be together at the same place at the same time. And not only are they synchronous, they're also typically at a pace that is set by the instructor, which in a sense, if you stop to think about it, treats education like a, like a conveyor belt. Um, maybe this dates all the way back to the, the Committee of Nine uh, back in 1911, you know, revamping uh, education in, in the United States. But it was literally like putting all of the students on the conveyor belt, all moving at the same pace, even though 
as we all know, learning doesn't take place at a, either at a steady pace nor at a pace that is the same for all of the students in our class. So let's look at some educational practices. A lecture like the one I'm giving you now is synchronous and the pace is set by the instructor. In this case, I am setting the pace because I'm talking and if your mind wanders, you probably will lose track of what I'm saying or miss a few words that I'm saying. A recorded lecture becomes asynchronous, but it's still instructor paced. In fact, I would argue, and I think the edX data and many other data back that up, it's not just instructor paced, it's one and a half times instructor paced because the students are trying to get through that video as quickly as they can. You know, even less matching the natural pace at which a student can learn optimally. A lab is synchronous because you need to be in the lab when the lab is available. But once you start working on an experiment in a lab, it's self-paced. And of course, homework, study are both asynchronous and self-paced. And as I was thinking about the different activities in my class, in the in-person class, and the one that I transitioned online, I set as a goal for myself to move as much away from synchronous to asynchronous and instructor-based to self-based as possible. In fact, I highly recommend you do this little exercise. Write down everything that you do in your classroom and ask yourself, does this activity have to take place synchronously? Can it be done asynchronously? And if it can be done asynchronously, can it be done as well as synchronously? Or what evidence can I collect to compare the two? I found that a very illuminating exercise, and which is why, you know, maybe this is a little of a homework assignment after my talk for you. And I found that actually most of the things I did in my classroom, even down to peer instruction, could be done asynchronously and at a pace determined by the student rather than by me, cutting off some students from thinking and having other students who are off task because I'm giving them too much time uh, to think. And I realized that the more I moved from synchronous to asynchronous and instructor paced to self-paced, the more I freed up of my time to help the students there where I think it really mattered. What about the student face-to-face -face time? Well, we've done a lot of collaborative work already, given that my, my course had been around for, you know, seven or so years. And most of the collaborative work was done in the classroom. You saw a picture of the classroom. It was done synchronously in the sense that students had to do that work when the classroom was available, spreading out over, you know, a number of hours. And thinking back, I realized that one of the drawbacks of asking students to come together and carry out teamwork in a classroom is that one, not all students are engaged. And teamwork is not necessarily very efficient precisely because not everybody's engaged and contributes uh, an equal amount to the teamwork. Also very poor use of staff time because essentially we'd be wandering in this classroom, walking from one table to the other. There will be some students with their hand ups and we would miss that. And, and, and sometimes we'd be you know, busy with one team whereas another team needed us uh, much more. And most importantly, no quality control because at the end of the class, students would just leave the class regardless of whether or not we'd had any check-in with them. So I decided for all, of the activities, which are all team-based in my class, to do the following. First of all, to require every single student to do the work individually before coming to class. And we hold them accountable for that individual work. So in other words, they have to go through the entire activity on their own. Then, so that's outside of any synchronous time, they come together and having worked on it individually, 
the really surprising thing, and this was actually, um, you know, sort of, I was reminded of that earlier this year. I'll tell you the anecdote in just a second. Um, the teams managed to get through the team activity in less than half the time than they normally would because everybody has already looked at it. So what they do is they end up comparing their notes, building on each other's work and, and synthesizing that. And after the team has synthesized the individual work into a, a team product, so to speak, we have a team check-in. They call us in. We have, a, we have a spreadsheet, which is very cleverly linked to, to, to other spreadsheets where students just click a button and we know, oh, these teams are, are ready for a check-in on that part of the assignment. We go in there, we check, and the cycle repeats if there is a second or a third part to, uh, to uh, the teamwork. Uh, and we still are left over with time that otherwise would be wasted hanging around and uh, ineffective teamwork. So in a sense, all the students are engaged because they all work on, the, on, 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 on it uh, uh, individually. Um, the team is much more efficient than it was before. And we have this quality control at the end uh, of, uh, of the teamwork. This year, I inserted one uh, activity, a tutorial actually, very early in the semester, actually on, on the first day of class. And um, I had not required the students to do this individual work. And we were all sitting there waiting for teams to call us in. Usually it takes 10 minutes or 15 minutes for the first check-in to, uh, to occur. And by 40 minutes, there was still not a single team that had called us in, showing you know how ineffective it is to bring people together. I, I think this holds actually true for meetings too. I think we should really start to implement flipped meetings, but rather than show and tell, people watch beforehand and then discuss during any synchronous time. In a sense, I sort of have flipped the teamwork uh, in, in, my, uh, in my class. The second thing I did was to personalize instruction. I, I'm not sure that this is really the best way of saying it. If you, if you can think of a better term, let me know. But I realized, you know, normally we ask our students to come to our space. I booked this classroom, the students come to the classroom. So when I went online, I had a Zoom room with breakout rooms and I asked the students to come to this Zoom room, my Zoom room. And then they'd go work with their teams in the breakout rooms. And over the summer, I thought, you know, that's not the best way of doing it. Instead of having the students come to my space, I should really have the instructional staff, myself, my colleagues, go to the students' uh, Zoom room. At that time, we had 80 students in the class. So instead of having 80 students in one room, we'd each team make its own Zoom room and in the end, we had 20 rooms with four students. Here, here's, uh, here's one of them. So this makes it much more difficult for students and the instructional staff to, to become disengaged. You know, it's very difficult when you collaborate with three others to turn your video off or start working on your email. And it's also much easier on Zoom to share your work, as you can see at the bottom, and I'm sure you've experienced uh, many times. Um, so um, it also creates the illusion for students that instead of being an 80 or this year, 140, you get punished when you do good work. <laughs> uh, 140 students, you know, it feels much more like a small seminar class than, than, than a large class. I remember last fall, we finally had a fair, a project fair that was in person again. We have a couple of these fairs per semester. And at the first fair, the students went, wow, I had no idea this was such a big class. I mean, after all, for them, it felt like a, like a four-person uh, uh, class. Um, what are some of the benefits other than engagement? Every student is sitting in the front row. And what's more, they have these great name tags. And by the end of the semester, I knew every single of the 80 students in my class. In fact, 
I think I got to know my students better than any other year. The third thing is the accountability. Um, and over the summer, 2020, not 2021, I read an article about a new approach to grading called specifications grading. And uh, if you Google this uh, article, Virginia, there is a better way to grade. Maybe somebody can do that and put the URL in the, in the, in the chat. You'll find an article inside higher ed that, that sort of explains the specifications grading. Let me give you the upshot of specifications grading because it has been a game changer. Some of you may have heard my talk on assessment and I think grades are the silent killer of learning because they replace intrinsic motivation to learn with an extrinsic motivator. And I don't really believe that grades measure what we want to know about students. I think it's a meaningless metric. And I'd struggled with that because unfortunately the registrar at Harvard at the end of the semester asked me to give each student uh, a grade, even though in the course I have four major learning outcomes and I measure essentially students' mastery of these four different uh, learning outcomes, which are self-directed learning, content mastery, effective teamwork, and professionalism. But specifications grading, and I, I realize, you know, giving up grades and going to a narrative or mastery type of grading, which while ideal, is probably not feasible at an institution like mine. And I think specifications grading, in a sense, permits to bridge the gap. Let me explain how specifications grading work. Essentially, it is a, um, an approach to grading where every single activity in the course is graded on whether or not it meets stated specifications. If you want, it's a pass-fail approach. Does this work meet specifications? Yes or no. And if the specifications are not met, then the student can try again. And if it has not been met again, can try again. You can always try again. In a sense, it destigmatizes failure and it permits you as an instructor to go higher up Bloom's taxonomy, where you know the risk of failure increases, as we know, you know, to be innovative, you have to fail, and you have to to provide an environment where students are, you know, feel comfortable occasionally uh, failing. Now, there's a finer gradation than what I'm showing here right now. For example, if the work vastly exceeds specifications, it gets an E for exemplary, or else just an M for meeting specifications. Both of these mean you've met specifications. And if it's not met specification, then determining on whether there was conscious effort to meet specifications, it either gets an R for revision needed or add N for uh, not uh, accessible. Now, here are some important things. The first one is, that I divided my course into 68 little micro units. So every single activity that the students engaged on was one unit for which I, I, um, I defined the specifications that had to be met. And in order to meet specifications, it is important that the students do both the individual and the teamwork. You show up in class without having done the individual work, sorry, you're not meeting specification. You do just the individual work, but not the teamwork. You have to meet with somebody from the teaching staff in order to go through the activity to make sure um, you meet specifications. And at the end of the course, students' course grade is determined not by whether or not they pass the high stakes examination, which can irreversibly pull people down, but by the number of units for which specifications have been met. Which means that when I give a certain letter grade to the students, at least I know for this number of units, the students, I can guarantee that the students has met specifications. If you want, given the, the large number of units, it's, it's sort of like a micro badging system, if you want. It was totally transformative in my class. Uh, I, I don't think I have ever seen students work as hard and because they're continuously seeing where they stand, 
they you know don't fall behind they they continue to to be engaged and work on the material and i, I wish i could share some of the feedback from students but one of the things that, that that stands out is how i heard one of my students describe some of the other science courses that um, this student was engaged in a term i had not heard before cram and flush and to some degree you know if i think back of many of my own courses you know it's sort of a, a sad truth that 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 it is that way so um did it work so let me start by showing some uh, learning gains that I've monitored over many, many years. The first one in the fall was an instrument called the Force Concept Inventory. I've used that for many years. And in this class, when it was taught online, the gain was a little bit smaller than when I taught in the auditorium was just peer instruction. But remember, there are many more learning outcomes in this course than before. But look now what happened during this entirely remote year. Pre-test at the beginning of the semester. This is pre, this is post when we were in person. This is pre when we were remote, more or less the same. Of course, it doesn't matter whether you teach remote or not, the pre-test is the pre-test. And the gain is almost doubled. In fact, if we put just the difference between these bars, there they are. And it is completely statistically significant. In the spring, I use a different instrument called the Conceptual Survey of Electricity and Magnetism. Actually an instrument where I've had a lot of difficulty getting a good gain. But there too, as you can see, the gain is doubled from the in-person class. And if anything, it's even more statistically significant than uh, the mechanics part of the course in the, in the fall. What about self-efficacy? Self-efficacy, in case you don't know, is a person's belief in being able to succeed in a certain domain if he or she tries. It's important, self-efficacy, because it determines whether an individual persists in the face of setbacks. When somebody with high self-efficacy encounters a setback, let's say a poor performance on a test or you know, a poor life performance, whatever it is, that person will typically shrug off the, the, the setback and, and try again. I had a bad day or I didn't practice enough. Now, when somebody with low self-efficacy encounters a setback, that, that setback typically leads to a feeling of, you know, simply not being able to do it. I'm not good at physics or, or physics is too hard for me. So when I, when I first started measuring self-efficacy in physics, I, I was using uh, peer instruction and I found out that the self-efficacy over the course of the semester did not change. Pre and post were the same. I was very disappointed by that uh, because I'd hoped that my interactive approach would you know, raise people's self-efficacy. But then I found out that in lecture-based introductory courses for non-majors, it's different for majors, but for non-majors, self-efficacy actually goes down. In other words, you know, students who are not going to major in physics who take an interactive physics course, they come out saying, you know, I, I, I don't like physics, physics too hard for me. It's sort of rubbed in this idea that they're not good at physics. So when, um, when I started using this team and project-based course, um, that was actually the first time that I saw a gain. So this is in person again, pre, post, and it is statistically significant but look now what happened when i taught this remotely here is again the pretest was in uh standard error the same as in uh, in person and a significantly larger uh, gain in fact the gain in self efficacy is twice that of the in-person course and what about the second part of the course the the, the spring again a very large gain you may wonder why do these students decay why is it that it goes up and then it goes back down? The simple reason is that only about half the students continue to the second semester in the same semester. So we had a big influx of students who had not taken AP50A, who pulled the students who came in with higher self-efficacy down. If you actually split this up, you see that there is a cohort of lower scoring students and higher scoring students. So there's a doubling of content learning gains. There's a doubling of physics self-efficacy gains. You know, what, what do the students say? Well, 
one of the surveys I took was this agile feedback survey from uh, Robert Talbert. You can find it on his blog. I think it's a great survey. It's agile because you can quickly give it and you can really use it to diagnose a lot of things in your uh, course. Read his blog for, for more detail. So here are the, the questions. The first two, I was challenged intellectually by the activities in this course and I had plenty of support from my course for my team members, the core staff and the materials sort of measured the balance between support and challenge. And um, when I taught in person in the spring of 2020, before we went uh, to remote teaching, you can see, uh, so, so essentially they, they, they rate these questions on a five point Likert scale from strongly disagree, degree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. So, you know, the students predominantly feel very challenged by the scores. But when I was in person in the large classroom, the support, they were kind of neutral. Look at what happened when we went to this new scheme that I just described, both in the fall and the spring. There's a huge jump in uh, support. This is sort of the ideal target zone where you want to be. You want to have a balance between challenge and support. If you just support them but don't challenge them, you're, you're coddling them. If you just challenge them, but you're not supporting them at all, you're stressing your students. So this is sort of the ideal balance between the two. And look at the jump from in-person to remote. The last three questions deal with self-determination. Um, so um, self-determination um, theory, um, essentially look at whether People in, I mean, self-determination looks at sort of the sense of gross autonomy and relatedness, you know, being part of a community that people have. And people who have a high sense of gross autonomy and relatedness tend to be better at problem solving or carrying out tasks. That's true, not just in education, but in any organizational settings, right? And employees in companies perform better when they have a high sense of gross, of autonomy and of uh, relatedness. So let's look at what happened in those three dimensions. Compare again the in-person in red with the remote in blue. I mean, I was really surprised and this was very consistent throughout both semesters. And this is not just a single data point. We, we, we measured it repeatedly. So the growth, sense of growth goes up, sense of autonomy goes up and sense of community goes up. And on top of that, uh, the course evaluation shot up. I ended up with a 4.9 on a five point scale, which is why I now have, I guess, 140 students in my class. Um, so clearly it worked for students too. In fact, I think it's no understatement to say that I did my best teaching ever remotely. I killed myself re re redesigning this entire course. I'm just kidding here. But, but you know, I definitely did my best teaching ever. So when the university said um, in uh, May last year, you know, we are going back to campus, I thought, what am I going to do? I mean, in light of these results, it would be almost unethical just to revert back to what I, what I did before. You know, I missed the students being in our active learning labs and in our maker spaces, building things. Uh, and, I, and I miss the excitement of in-person fairs where, where students could show off their, their, uh, their, their devices. Um, but, you know, was I simply to go and, and revert back? I, um, I, I agonized over that. And, you know, I thought, naively that um, the summer of 2020, I could finally take some time off. I wouldn't have to work as hard as the summer, sorry, the summer of 2021. I wouldn't work as, I wouldn't need to work as hard as the summer of 2020, but um, uh, it turned out I had to, again, invest a lot of time in readapting to a new reality. So what were the main changes I'd implemented in 2020? I told you, optimizing face-to-face -face time, personalizing instruction, establish continued accountability. 
the first and the last one were a no-brainer, right? I mean, there was no reason not to retain those, regardless of whether, you know, I was teaching online or in person. But I also have gotten this sense that even though we were virtual in 2020, we were closer than ever. I don't know, I don't know how to explain that feeling. I really felt that I had connected with my students much, much better than I'd ever done in a physical classroom. So without asking for approval, because I would undoubtedly have been shot down, I decided to ignore what my administration had said and essentially offer a multimodal approach this year. Students as a team could either go to the classroom, Pierce 301, and sit around the table, or they could go to their Zoom room. Of course, in the classroom, you can see this is a pre-pandemic picture. They'd have to wear a mask, which is not necessary on, uh, on Zoom. In either case, they use Zoom as a sharing mechanism. So when they're around the table, they pull up their laptop and they connect to their team Zoom room, but they don't turn their camera on and they don't connect to audio because you, know, you can just talk and see each other. There's no need for it. So the experience is very much the same in the classroom and in, on Zoom. I have to tell you, the night before class started, I was kind of nervous because I was wondering what is going to happen here. Are they going to show up online? Are they going to be in the classroom? I mean, the very first class I made sure it was online anyway. It was during the shopping period. I I I wanted to give students flexibility, and um, and then they had to tell me whether they wanted to go in person or in the classroom. Well, on the first day in class, eighty-five percent showed up in person. And you know, less than twenty percent showed up on uh, Zoom, participated remotely. I think that's not surprising, right? Put yourself back in September, twenty twenty one. People had been working remotely for over a year. I think everybody was hungry for being together physically again. But look how this evolved over the course of the year. There was a steady decline and by the end of the term it was more or less flipped with most of the students participating remotely and only a few in fact there are two class sections and on this day i forgot when it was uh but it was probably near thanksgiving um we had one of the two class sections where nobody showed up in person essentially at the tables there was one teaching fellow and myself, it was, it looked like a call center because we were each, you know, on our call with, with, with a team. Now, let me show this data slightly differently because it gets more interesting. Let's stack these two values on top of each other. Here you see the same data, but now I've put one on top of the other. And you can see that the attendance is more or less steady throughout the term. There is no diminished attendance as students move to remote over the course of the semester. In fact, um, oh, and the other thing is this, the gains, namely the content and the self-efficacy are the same. Um, I, I won't put the, the data up again, but they're the same as they were in the remote scenario. So there's no difference. It can be implemented both in both modalities. But look also at the attendance. The attendance is nearly 100% throughout. And if anything, as there was a stronger shift toward remote, we have more of a 100% uh, attendance. So something else interesting happened. You see, in the syllabus, I'd said that if a team wanted to meet online rather than in the classroom, they would also be able to time shift. Right, because the classroom, the physical classroom forces us to be at the same place at the same time, because otherwise that room is occupied. Cyberspace is infinite. We have as many rooms as we want. We don't need to build a new classroom. It's instantaneous. We can meet here while simultaneously many other people meet on Zoom as well. 
So it was not until fairly late into the semester that one team somewhere in the middle of, uh, of October approached me and said, you know, one of us has a doctor's appointment and, and, and can't come to class. And I said, well, if you want, you can have a check-in with the staff, um, you know, tonight or tomorrow. And that was the first time that it happened. Then we had a graduate student strike and I actually asked teams to, you may remember the strike back uh, in, uh, towards the end of October. And several of my teaching fellows were unable to come to class because they didn't want to cross the picket line. And I actually asked teams to shift their time shift, their meeting, and four teams took us up. I'll let you guess what this is here. Thanksgiving, many students, this was the, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, many students were traveling, but note still 100% attendance. 100%. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. So in a sense, I think that this approach is breaking down the, the, the classroom walls. It, it, it provides a flexibility in education. And, and it really, I think, shakes the university model to its core, right? Because it sees that it shows that there is no need necessarily at least not for the educational part, for a physical infrastructure. You could think of an education that reaches way beyond where it reaches now, as long as there's internet. I mean, and people who are normally at a disadvantage might actually get a high quality education. So, you know, returning back to Yuval Harari, I, I think remote teaching, at least for me, may, may well become a, uh, a, a fixture of life. And I think that with the changes that I've presented to you, it's possible to improve. In, in a sense, the pandemic was an opportunity for that, to improve the pedagogy as well as course outcomes, and also to improve the efficiency and the flexibility of uh, our teaching approaches. Thank you very much for listening to my, uh, to my wild ideas. I look forward to uh, a discussion and uh, answering any questions. I see already one, uh, I see several, lots of questions in the chat. So I'll hand it back over to you. Oh, and if you want to look at the Canvas page for my course, this is the uh, URL. I'll paste it in, the, in the Slack. Oh, and I also have my slides so you can read look at this um, uh, at your own uh, leisure. We'll be sending follow-up materials to uh, everyone uh, who's attended, um, including uh, recording of the lecture after it's processed. Um, we have a, a few, uh, few minutes for questions. There's a few that were entered in the chat already. I don't know, Eric, if you have, the have had the time to process any of those. Um, yes. And in the meantime, uh, we'll plan to stop at two, but if folks want to raise their hand and ask a question, I will call on you in the order that you appear. But if you want to handle the chat questions at the moment, they were just a handful. Um, why don't we start with that, Eric? I'll let you moderate, uh, Janet. Oh, I see one hand up, Yuhon. Oh, thank you. Um... So Professor Mazo, I recently published a study that shows that problem solving skills degrade more rapidly than you would imagine. And the more complex the subject matter, the faster and more they degrade. Now you mentioned your assessment does not include tests, but is a specifications grading. How do you determine that if somebody meets specifications, say in September or October, come February and March, they still know what they passed back in September and October? That's a very good question. So let me bounce the question right back at you. When you grade an exam and give a person a score, how do you know that that person still can get that score um, you know, a few months later? In fact, I would love to do, this, this has been on my mind for a long time, a very devious experiment. Maybe you're willing to participate. I think it would be fantastic if we did an exam from a course by a faculty member in our department 
and administer it to our colleagues in that same department under the same circumstances as the students who are taking that test. I promise you, well, I don't promise, I can't promise anything, but I predict that the results will be quite shocking. So I don't know. So the, the answer to your question is, I don't know. I cannot guarantee what happened. And you know, people have shown that if you don't keep refreshing your knowledge and 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 what you know and keep honing your skills. I mean, imagine, you know, okay, you learn how to play the piano and you give a, a, a great performance after learning to play the piano. And we say, Yihon, you get an A for playing piano. You stop playing the piano and you know, a year later, we are going to have a high stakes test where we ask you to play the piano, but you haven't touched the piano for a while. I don't think you'll play the piano very well. I know that for myself, if I stop doing something, the skills go down. So I, I, I don't think there's any way you can guarantee with any test that a person's skills will remain high. I'd like to continue this discussion with you, maybe via email, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. More than happy to. Janet, you're muted. Hey, Jacob White, are you still here? You had your hand up. I, I did have my hand up. Uh, I'll ask my question since you picked on. <laughs> I was curious about these the these checkoff interviews because uh, we may be using them in a somewhat different way. We try to uh not only evaluate whether the student has understood what we wanted them to understand but also try to fill in gaps in their understanding that kind of debug the few things they didn't get right and what we've discovered if there is any kind of evaluation going on during that interview there's some kind of grade associated with it if we move away at all from either you pass it or you can redo it again that no at no uh penalty, if we do any kind of evaluation, students will not let you see what they don't understand. That is, they will cover up whatever. So what we're trying to do is to figure out what they've gotten confused about and fix it. And they're trying, if they think it's being evaluated, to keep us from finding out what they didn't understand and fix it. How, do you have a strategy for dealing with that? Or do you just do not really use the these interviews for evaluation? Oh, totally. We use them completely for evaluation. So, so in a sense, it, it becomes like, a, I, it, what we do is we have the team presents a team solution. And we make sure that, you know, we rotate among the team members. We have, we have a log, so we know exactly who was, has presented. And, you know, they, they, they sort of present it. And we, we sort of semi-Socratically help them when, when, when we notice that they're on the wrong track. So, you know, one student may be presenting and at some point that student says something that's incorrect and, you know, very much like, you know, uh, somebody in the business school is, who is doing a case study, you know, we play out the students at the, uh, against each other. Sarah, do you think that what, uh, what Bob just said um, um, is, well, we don't say it's correct, but, but, you know, we sort of, we, we sort of ask them for, for their opinions and try to lead them to the right answer. Takes more time, we can't always do it because you know there, there is a finite amount of time, but I think it's so much better than just teaching by telling. Great, in the interest of time, I'd like to take Steve Ehrman's question and then Eric, if maybe you could address a few of the questions in the chat, some are pretty quick, I think, and then- um, Sure, and sure, and I'm, I'm not, a, I have no time constraint right now, so I can stay longer if necessary, Steve. Yeah, uh, about attendance. I know that when uh, the MIT physics department was deciding about whether to go forward with Teal, the one of the, um, actually this may have been RPI, but at any rate, one of the biggest, uh, the, the data that weighed the heaviest was, look how the intent, attendance increases compared with our traditional ways of instruction. So you talked about the marvelous attendance figures for the revised course. How would you compare that with the earlier version of this course and with other comparable courses in the physics department, if you happen to have that information. Yeah, I do, I do. So, um, so the, the attendance have, has been 
what has always been high because I think the students perceive a greater value in coming to class than 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 just listening. With peer instruction, it also was greater than when I lectured. When I lectured, you know, maybe sixty five percent of the students showed up, and then when I started using peer instruction, um, uh, that went up. I don't think it went up to ninety seven. I, I have to dig in back into the older data because I have we have the data, but. Um, so I think attendance is correlated to the value, quote unquote, that students see in the in the in class activity. And there, I'm happy to report that there is no major difference between remote participation and in person participation. I see an interesting question by Ed. Did did I answer your question, Steve? Right. So Ed has an interesting uh, question, but I'm very eager to uh, answer. Um, uh, has the role of peer instruction changed during this period? So peer instruction, the way I implemented, consisted of asking conceptual questions, then having students think about it, commit to an individual answer, find a neighbor who has a different answer and try to convince that neighbor of the answer, then re-answering a second time. Um, I'm happy to report, I haven't spoken about this publicly yet, that I found a way of doing this completely asynchronously, no class time taken, and do it much, much better. We're crunching the data right now. I hope to report on that sometime soon than um, when it was in the physical classroom. Essentially, the students go to two rounds online, the first one is alone. So they answer a series of questions individually. The question do not need to be multiple choice. They can be open-ended. And then they meet with their team in a Zoom room and they rejoin that session. Now, instead of just seeing their questions with their own, the questions with their own answers, they see at the top of the screen, the answers that each person has given. Steve said, 300 newtons, Bob said 240 newtons, Maria said 240 newtons, whatever. They start talking and they ask, you know, why do you get 200? Why do you get 140? And they can look things up online. We have to make sure that our questions are not Googleable, but that's a small price to pay. And, um, and then once they reach agreement, they enter the answer and they get immediate feedback. It's automated. If it's right, they get four points. There's a gaming aspect to it. If it's wrong, they get a second try and two points. If it's wrong again, they get a second search or, uh, search option at one point. If it's wrong again, a solution is revealed and there's access to a recorded video explanation. Several things I want to say. One, the good thing is students are never off task, right? In the classroom, you ask a question and they think some will answer quickly, others will need more time to think. As an instructor, you can't wait forever. So you either wait long and then a lot of students are off task or you don't wait long enough and you cut some students off. So it's not optimized that process. Lastly, students start talking to each other, some quickly come to an agreement, others need much more time, and the same problem happens again. Here, that's completely taken away because it only works for either an individual or a team at a time, and the teams and the individual can take as much or as little time as they want, nobody else is waiting. It's even better, they get three tries rather than just one try. Now, the first year that I did this, I invested an enormous amount of time recording all these explanations. It was crazy. My, part of my home here was, was a whole video studio where I recorded them one after the other. At the end of the year, I looked at how many students had watched the video. 4% or so, 5%. I mean, I was mortified. I mean, it's probably one of the worst investments I made. And in the beginning, I didn't understand why that was the case. But you know, the problem is that most students didn't even get to the video. They had three chances, right? If you get it right along the way because somebody says, hey, or has this aha moment, they don't need to look at the video. Furthermore, before they get to the video, they see also a written explanation and it's usually much 
quicker to scan the written explanation than to go through a three or, or you know, two or four minute video. So I've stopped doing that video because it's just not worth uh, uh, adding them. But um, just looking superfluously at the data, and I want to I want to call out Denise um, Marti. Are you still here, Denise? <laughs> who uh, who who um, is actually a postdoc with the Learning Incubator, who had who who worked on uh, on analyzing these data and who's working now on analyzing sort of the the asynchronous peer instruction to see how that works. Um, Eric, there's a few other questions in the chat. And I, again, I realize if folks need to leave and we'll try yep. to wrap it up soon, but um, one is how do you ensure that, pe that people do the prior work before they meet with their teams? And yep. then um, how do you measure, can you measure attendance? Like, do, how, do you, how do you do that? Um, on Tuesday, we have a tutorial. On Thursday, we have a um, an assignment, and the tutorial we um, I, I'm dying to show that to you. This is just so amazing. We use a platform called Desmos. It's free. I don't know how they make money, frankly. Um, and um, let me uh, share my screen here. So essentially, we took our um, we took all our worksheets, we would give them worksheets and they work on these worksheets in the classroom. But you know, it's on paper, so they would walk away. We wouldn't even know if they had incorrect information on it. So, so essentially we took, uh, we took this, um, this worksheet and, and turned it into a Desmos, um, a, a Desmos worksheet. Now here's the beauty. You have this dashboard that shows all of the students and, and if they, if they've done something on a screen, it shows a dot. We, we look at more than that, but we can right away see if there are any students who have not done anything, this student, for example. And, um, and so, so you can sort of see there, there are a couple of students who will have to redo this tutorial for this week. They also can see each other's answers there where, where, where we set it to, to share uh, the answer. So we review this just before they come in, in class. We don't look for correctness. We look that, you know, they've actually put in the effort and, and, and worked on it. There are questions that include sketching things. Let's see, I don't have putting equations in. Uh, there are here, you know, sketches. So, so we can review every single student's work uh, before class. And since we only look for effort before class rather than correctness, it is, uh, it is uh, really quickly. And then with the assignment, we have them upload the assignment to Gradescope before class. And then they have to mark it up in class uh, and they receive then a solution and they have to upload their assignment with a reflection after class. So we have two different uploads. We have the before class and the after class. And, and that's how we hold them accountable for, for both parts. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question about what whiteboarding app you use um, that you know, there's sort of accessibility, affordability issues and, and how seamless these, when students have to interact with each other. So if you yeah, want so, so Harvard Institute, uh, an uh, iPod loaner program um, so nearly all students have an iPad and, uh, and a stylus and, and then you can just share your iPad over, um, over Zoom. Um, I, I, since I don't lecture, I don't need to share my whiteboard. They are the ones using the whiteboard. And then if I need to give them some pointers, I use the annotation tools in, uh, in Zoom, which is not ideal. But, uh, but it works reasonably well. And then in Desmos, there are drawing tools. Students, you know, proficiency with using those drawing tools increases over the course of the year that this course uh, takes place. Um, and they essentially use the Zoom sharing tools to share their drawings with, uh, with one another. Desmos, exactly, desmos.com. And there are two, two sort of platforms 
One is uh, student.desmos.com, which is the one the students use, and then teacher.desmos.com that gives you instructor privileges. Okay, I, maybe one more question from the chat here. Ed uh, Birchinger asks, um, has the role of peer instruction changed during the period, this period, period of the pandemic, I assume? Um, uh, physics has some experience with peer mentors um, lowering the learner threshold for asking questions. So I think I answered that question. Uh, uh, you know, it became asynchronous. There's an interesting question that I think I need to answer from Rhea Love. Um, hi, Rhea. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. So, um, you. What is the typical ratio of instructors to students in this course? So it's not changed. Uh, we, we typically get a quarter time TF for 10 students. Um, um, I've done something different this year and I've uh, moved away. So, so I have a core of graduate students TFs who, who I have organized in teams. So there's a little team of two graduate student TFs who take care of the asynchronous peer instruction. There are two who take care of the assignments. There are two who take care of the tutorials. And there are two who take care of the uh, projects. Um, and, and then I've hired, because it's way more economical, undergraduate students for simply for the check-ins. And um, essentially what happens is that at the beginning of the term, I have some of the undergraduates who are applying for uh, a course assistant uh, job in my course to just shadow me. They, they go with me and do a check-in with a team and they observe me and they see how I do it. Since we have all the solutions ready for the teaching team, I typically have the solution on one side of my screen, even when I meet in person and I sh have Zoom on the other side of my screen so I can, I can always compare, they, they, they see that too, but they see how I lead the discussion in a semi-Socratic way. So I, I get to train them much better than I ever uh, trained them before by having them in the beginning of the term shadow me. And I can typically hire about four undergraduates for one graduate student. So that, that makes it possible to have a much larger number of people uh, in the classroom. In fact, class time has been reduced because of this. We used to have two 75 minutes periods together back to back three hours. When I went to pandemic, I re I limited that to 75. And now I find that I often can do with less than 75 because the teams are ready. Terrific. Um, I, think, I think we'll wrap up now. Um, amazing presentation, really inspiring work. And um, we thank you for being so generous with your time, Eric, and for sharing this uh, hot off the presses uh, uh, data with us. So um, let's thank, thank Eric again for coming and sharing with us. Thank you. I see an interesting question from Joy. I'm trying to answer it in the chat. I don't know if she's I'm still sorry, here. Yeah. Hi, yeah, sorry. It's a very last minute question, but if you want to answer it out loud, that would also be fine. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so let me. So, Joy is asking, oh boy, your, your question uh, scrolled away. Uh, mm -hmm. That I'm not a big fan of asynchronous lecture videos. It's true. I, um, I think that asynchronous lecture videos take a very passive activity and make it not only passive, but completely isolating, right? I mean, you're alone. You're not even sitting in a room with other people. Um, and, you know, ultimately it's the engagement that matters. So you may know about Perusal, which is a platform I started actually developing when I developed this course eight years ago. It's a social annotation platform. So essentially you assign reading and students can highlight parts of the text to open a chat window and then interact with each other. Uh, that took off, you know, not, there are some 2 million students around the, the, the world now using that, that platform. And, um, I always resisted putting video because I mean, essentially you could do exactly the same thing with video. I always resisted video because I had such a negative view as you correctly pointed out of asynchronous lecture videos. But when the pandemic hit, I thought, you know, we have to implement that. And I was totally 
you know, flabbergasted by the result because I realized that if you, if you have a student just watch a video, even if it's an interactive video that has questions, the students just try to get through the video as quickly as they can. And they will typically spend less time than the total video watching the video, even if there are questions that require thinking that stop them. Um, but when you add a layer of social annotation on top of that, right, you can stop the video, add a comment, and people see these bubbles of other people asking questions, you slow them down. And now a 20 minute video, rather than taking 10 minutes because they play twice as fast, you know, takes 40 minutes because they're spending time answering each other's questions, interacting with each other. So I, I've, I've sort of reversed myself a little bit there. And I think that, that um, asynchronous video can work provided you give an opportunity for the students to, to interact with each other, with their peers and to, in, to interact with the material. I think that makes sense. Thanks so much. And thanks for the really uh, inspiring uh, thought provoking talk. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you all again for coming. Um, as I said, we'll be sharing resources from the talk, links, and uh, and resources uh, after after we get everything processed. So look out for that and look out for our upcoming speaker series presentations in March and April. Thank you. Thank everyone. you so much for having me. Thank you, Eric. Amazing, amazing work. Thank you.